Buildings are alive. Architects are more like gardeners. That's kind of the theme of what, what the talk is about today. It's on undividedness and beauty. This has to do with the climate exceptionally. I mean, it, it's a fundamental to an understanding of our connection as human beings to the larger planet, planetary system. And you'll kind of get the drift of what, how this links up when I eventually get to a building that has something to do with, with climate change, uh, the Aldo Leopold Legacy Center, which is one of the, f the f actually the first documented building to be carbon neutral in operation. And so there's an aspect of building that is in totally connected to the, to the climate. And, and hopefully you'll, you'll get the drift. But I'm going to have to move kind of fast. Well, I presume that the world is undivided, whole, and meaningful, that a unity of creation exists, and it is beautiful. That's the starting point. And uh, it's manifested, this idea is manifested in, in a prairie. It's a system that works completely together. It's undivided. There aren't any parts that are actually left over in a prairie. A prairie is whole and complete and beautiful and man-made. So a prairie, even a prairie doesn't leave people out. People are totally interwoven with, with the, the creation of a, of a prairie. The natives modified the landscape for thousands of years to create that. So the idea here is that nothing is left out, that we have to be connected in a way to understand what the larger idea of the planet is. So, how does a building, what does a building have to do with that? Well, a building can be alive too. At least I think so. And I, I, our lifelong goal is to make a building that smiles. So the big question is, can a building be alive? What is it that makes a building alive? How can I recognize one if it is alive? How can I make one? As, as people who make things, that's, the, that's what it eventually comes down to. Can we actually make a building alive? And then the bigger question comes up, what's stopping me? John Donahue says, our times are driven by the inestimable energies of the mechanical mind. There is a, a, reduction, a reductionist point of view in the world that uh, tends to get in the way of what I'm talking about. That's what's stopping. It stopped me for a long time. It stops a lot of people from thinking in an undivided universe. It's, it includes stylistic thinking and it includes mechanistic thinking. And both of them are what I call reductionism's henchmen. So stylistic thinking, uh, normally, you, um, and I might be really unpopular here <laughs> today by saying this, but stylistic thinking is a, is a major problem in the world of architecture. Uh, we're bombarded daily by these, the covers of architectural journals that have these buildings that are pretty much disconnected from human beings as well as being disconnected from the natural world. They're very, uh, they have a lot of oomph and impact for about 10 or 15 minutes and then th they no longer contribute. Style driven process starts, always starts with a concept. It's a predetermined idea about what a building should be. And then the, the parts and pieces, the program and everything, are made to fit the concept. Um, I'm sure you're aware of this. You know, architects a lot of times are measured, their success is measured on how well their initial ideas or concept, their sketch, actually can be transformed into a real building. And that's, I mean, that, that's the essence of success in, in the architectural journals. But what I think is what it does is it forces designers to stop listening because their whole design process is built on making the building look like the sketch. So they can't listen to anybody else 
because that gets in the way. It's a language that's not easily shared because it's usually very personal. They have to oversimplify complexity in order to drive the, the concept through to, to final uh, construction. It's deaf to ecological needs because there's no place for uh, the natural world in a concept-driven stylistic thinking and it lacks long-term value because it is stylistic. The other one, the other bigger one here is, the, is mechanistic thinking and this is, this, uh, in, what should I say, it's part of our culture, it's endemic in Western culture. And for architects, a lot of uh, mechanistically driven processes have to do with rooms as elements that get assembled, uh, forces between the rooms. It's very atomistic in a, in a way. Uh, many times high performance buildings are, are designed as machines. Um, this kind of thinking also gets overlaid onto the environment, whereas like, a, like a, a fully functioning ecosystem becomes a leveled parcel of zoned uses connected to customers and services by a vehicle conveyance system. You know, our whole real estate kind of industry is based on a, a, a very mechanical look at, at the ground. So, mechanistic thinking fragments a larger continuity. It discounts feelings and emotions. It marginalizes art and beauty by definition. There is no place for beauty in a mechanistic worldview. It is often imposed, almost always imposed on nature, and it artificially separates form from function. So, what is a better way? What is a better way to think about the design process when you want to design a building that's alive, that's fully connected to the world? And we, we have employed for 35 years now the work of Christopher Alexander. It's uh, the, the book, A Pattern Language, is the most read book on architecture in the world. It's the, probably the least read book by architects. So that should give you a clue. <laughs> And he's written other books, and there are many influences that kind of correlate and, and combine to uh, form our way of thinking about this. But a, a pattern is a recognizable dance between human activity and the built and or natural environment. Think of uh, an eddy. It's got a name. We know what it looks like. But you can't scoop it out of the, out of the stream and put it in your living room because it's, an eddy is defined by its interconnectedness with a whole. It has to do with wind stress, up, Ekman updwelling, eddy, the uh, eddy advection, the, the how much nutrients are in the water, the, the shape of the coastline. So if you imagine that a building is like an eddy, that building cannot exist without its natural connections to every other force uh, near it or even at, at a distance. So a pattern is whole in that it excludes nothing and is connected to everything. Can you start to see how this connects to the idea of climate? All right, so because um, climate deniers will have a massive me mechanistic thinking process going on in their mind. They've already separated themselves from the natural world. So when a building is alive, a patterns, patterns occur at all levels of scale, nested in a continuous unbroken field. So the question is, are patterns really the, the authentic parts of the built and natural world? And I would say yes, they are. Uh, because really there are two ways of seeing the world. One is the, uh, the mechanistic way where you assemble the parts, where you, where you apply a theory to parts of the, of the environment that uh, are like one another. The other way demands a completely different consciousness, a way of thinking about the world as already whole, and that its parts are only differentiated aspects of that whole. See, in that worldview, nothing is left out. In the worldview on the right, many things are left out. So, way of discovering patterns for us, and I'm going to go through this very quickly, we observe everything without abstraction as best we can. I know it's nearly impossible to do that. We hold what we observe in our minds. We feel discontinuities and features where they occur. Then we name those discontinuities and features, and then we discover reasons for their appearance, and we propose a solution that resolves the forces that we see as, as problematic. So we're looking for weaknesses in a, in a hole that tend to pop up. 
At the Aldo Leopold Legacy Center, this is the building that's net uh, carbon neutral in operation and net zero energy. We developed 45 patterns. Um, all the green patterns have to do with the sustainability or regenerative nature of the building. So we're not, again, in our design process, we're not separating <coughs> patterns having to do with the natural world from patterns having to do with the social aspect of it or the cultural aspect or the mechanical and built in environments. And as an example, I'd like to go a little bit more into depth on the first Unitarian Society uh, meeting house edition in, in Madison. We wrote 29 patterns having to do with the largest scale issues, the fact that it is a national treasure or a national landmark building, all the way down to the medium and smaller scale issues having to do with how the congregation operates as a whole, how it, how, where are the problems showing up in the existing building. And so I'm going to talk about the one, just one pattern in detail called the new front door. And in this case, it's the problem statement was that the bottleneck at the current front door and lobby cannot be repaired without either reducing the number of people utilizing that entrance or by greatly increasing the size of the lobby, thereby altering forever its original character and, and presence. So they have a congregation of 1,400 at the time. They had big problems with their existing meeting house, which was designed for 125. People wouldn't stay after the because there was no room to stay, all that kind of stuff. So the solution in this case was to create a brand new prime door, prime door and lobby sized appropriately and give that door markings as to its function and importance and locate the new front door within visual proximity to the historic. We always try to write patterns as metaphors because as a metaphor, the, the hearer of the metaphor is always a participant, not a, just a listener. So for you to make sense of a metaphor, you have to use your mind, right? And it's everyone's uh, understanding of a metaphor is slightly different. It's, to, to us, it's a more natural way to communicate uh, complex ideas. And it involves the participation of our client group as well. So as an example, landscape visits the writer. This is a pattern that was written by our landscape designer, in fact, uh, for a re writer's retreat in, in Door County. So what happens <clears throat> with the patterns? Do they just stay as a list of things that are interesting about the building that we're going to design? Or do they have a role in the, in the, in the way that the, the building actually unfolds, which is the word we really like to use? Alexander has modeled his whole design process after a, a morphogenesis, which is a, obviously the way things get formed in the natural world. It's a, it's a very peculiar process, and um, there's a lot to learn by it. You know, we've, we've been bombarded lately with this idea that our genes and our DNA structure is almost mechanical in its operation, that we're kind of slaves to a genetics system. But very recently, in the last 10 to 15 years, that whole idea of the genes as machines have, has been totally uh, turned around. As you can see, both of these little insects are, have the same genetic structure. And one of them, at the bottom, that one becomes that shape through environmental uh, interaction with their genes. This is called gene expression. So there's a lot more to, to genes than, uh, than you uh, might think of at first. <clears throat> so the patterns unfold. There's a potential for them to unfold very much like uh, a plant unfolds. So in, when we design a building, we have this kind of long process that in, includes pattern writing, and then we unfold, unfold the design in an orderly way. We start at the very largest scale. Largest scale decisions get made first. We move to the next one in a, in a hopefully in a very smooth process. It's important that the order is, is there, that we understand the order of decisions so that the smooth unfolding can take place as does an embryo. So again, we'll go back to this list of uh, patterns that we wrote. And this is a little bit of an unfolding that takes place on the site where the, uh, the original building, this was an addition, later addition by Taliesin. This was an addition done by um, the uh, 
Frank Lloyd Wright studio, and the original building is right there. So there are a number of issues that we had to consider in terms of where do we put the addition, because we basically had to double the size of the building. The untouchability gradient as a pattern talked about the, the fact that we needed to preserve portions of the building. There were portions that were quite maybe not preservable, and then areas that were free game. So the Taliesin addition, which they were still making mortgage payments on, was up, up, for, up for grabs. <laughs> Uh, so there's, you know, two basic ways, places to put a building addition. And then th this is where a pattern comes in. So we talk about that new front door pattern and we start to apply it. The fact that we need to be able to see the front door when we enter the property and that the, the, the doors themselves have to see one another in order to have some kind of relationship. So that immediately eliminates one of the possible places to expand the building. So what happened is that we uh, eventually then came up with a way to, in, to create a new geometry that linked all the parts and pieces together. We have two-story connection to the two-story aspects to the original building. We make sense about, of other uh, parts of the building and we create new outdoor spaces, etc. Put a lot of the square footage on the lower level that had access to the south because of the, the grade sloped. And eventually came to the the addition, where we have this very tender spot <coughs> where the connection is made. This is, an, an, again, a, a, a lead gold rated, it's the first gold rated church in Wisconsin. And a lot of it has to do with how water uh, hits the site, how it moves, where, how it's absorbed. <coughs> The stormwater problems before the building was built were really bad. And the fact that we added that much building and, uh, and reduced the amount of water that eventually went into the storm system uh, is quite remarkable, I think. Daylight, of, of course, had a lot to do with this, the use of the uh, particular materials. The, being able to create a volume of this large without it competing with the, the National Monument of the land, national landmark was a, a big part of <clears throat> the whole pattern process because the very first pattern, if you remember, is called a national treasure. And that everything following that is in deference to the fact that this is a landmark building. So we did everything we could in order to make sure that what we added was actually uh, boy, boying, uh, lifting up the original building. So, Ultimately, beauty is a profound illumination of presence, a stirring of the invisible, invisible form, and in order to receive this, we need to cultivate a new style of approaching the world. So we get back to this idea that it it's really starts with consciousness and in how you perceive how the world or the, or the universe, in fact, is, is organized and put together. So a lot of our job is to beautify our gaze. And we propose to the world, basically, that writing pattern requires a new kind of education, one steeped in the ability to recognize wholeness when it occurs. Both the gaze that sees and the object that is seen construct themselves simultaneously in the one act of vision. So you, again, it's like a metaphor, you're the participant, you're a participant in the viewing something, you're a participant in seeing the world and you have choices, and you can see a duck or a rabbit without any of the lines changing before you. So the last thought is, um, pattern writing is a way forward. The making of living buildings demands the design process that is alive. And thank you very much for your attention. So it was an interesting and fascinating uh, presentation, obviously. What's the one thing you, know, you would say you want people to come away from seeing something like this with the understanding of? I think it's that the fact that we are, the, the planet is, a, is one thing, and um, no one is ex excluded from it. That um, for the planet to be alive, however, is that we have to pay attention to everything. It's, it's that really interesting thing. If you do a painting 
and you know that one part of it is weak, it bothers you if, as an artist. If you, you keep thinking about it and you work at it, we have to, I guess, see the world as a, as a painting. And you paint as well, Tom? Yes. <laughs> Watercolor. Yes. There was a question here? Yeah. Um, you, talk, you talked about how you have to uh, make your decisions in, in the, right, the natural order, you know, sort of like when cells are dividing. Right. How do you determine those, that order? How do you, how do you identify the natural order right. so it doesn't become me uh, mechanistic? Right. It's a, that's a really important skill to have. And the, we, we debate in the studio if we're really doing a, a heavy-duty pattern language approach. We debate as to that, what that order is. And we, one of the ways that we figure out the order is we test the decisions. So if you decide that the building has to be located on the lot somewhere, where is it, where is it going to end up? That's a fairly large-scale decision to make. What follows from that are a number, series of other decisions that are either made easier or harder by the first decision. So there's a smoothness that you begin to see in the way that the, that the, the problems that you have to solve are ordered. And if we, if we do it right, we can, we, you can start to see that the work being done at larger scale uh, just creates the environment for the solutions to come easier down the road. When, if, say, if there's a client who says, you know, I really like a, a bedroom next to whatever, and he, he holds on to that idea, it kind of fractures that smooth unfoldingness because that consideration can't be central to the placement of the building on the lot. But in, in for many clients that, without their kind of understanding of this process, they can really get in the way of a smooth flowing uh, decision-making process. So as part of our jobs, we, our joke in the studio is that we spend our profits educating our clients. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so it, th that's a big part of what we do. But yes? Do you ever have to uh, go back and revise the, the larger problem because of new things that came out in the unfolding process? Yes. And how do you address that? Yes. <clears throat> it's, not a, you know, it's not a static process. So if we discover something new, it, obviously we have to go back to the beginning. That's why we spend a whole lot of time in that pre-design discovery process. That is the critical to the, if you, we have to know everything possible about this building, even things that the client doesn't know. We, we go much bigger in terms of the regional aspect, the, the, the climate aspects, the, you know, the natural systems that are uh, occurring on the site, the cultural aspects of the entire area so that we don't make, we don't miss something at a big scale because that means we have to kind of start over. That uh, the first Unitarian Church design that we eventually did was a start over <clears throat> because we came to a point where we agreed on a plan and then they came up with the idea that, well, we only have half the money that we thought we did. <laughs> so we tried to cut, hack and cut our design, right, to the, the addition, and uh, it didn't work. It was obvious because it was just uh, cutting to, make sure, to see if it worked at all. So we, we actually regrew the building from the beginning, but we used the same pattern language. So what was lost was a little, you know, design effort, but was what was there that was solid because it was based in fact and, and, and consensus, you know, that people agreed on the pattern. So we could, this, that final design went really fast because we understood the conditions so, so fully that it was very efficient. But we, we had to do it for half the price. Yes. Um, as you've like grown and learned all of this step by step, what has been one of your favorite mistakes or learning experiences? <clears throat> the most common mistake, <laughs> which keeps coming up over and over again, is to use precedent as a, as a design tool. <laughs> so I, I hear there's some recognition to that product, <laughs> right? So often if, you, if you're not prepared to go through a, like a, a, an understanding, a deep understanding of the problem that you need to solve, 
it's almost, it's like a really simple thing to say, well, how was it done here, how was it done there? And it short circuits the whole discovery process. So that, for me, is the mistake that we make, you know, over and over again, and we're trying to unlearn that. Um, your slide on discovering yes. patterns with yes. the, the six steps yes. reminded me a lot of the tenets of mindfulness, and yes. I was wondering if that plays a role in your work. Definitely. All. It's all about mindfulness. And it goes back to Goethe. I've, I've been reading about Goethe's process for observation, <clears throat> and he essentially says exactly the same thing. He says, set aside your ego, look upon an, a plant. In this case, he, looked, he was observing plants. And do it without a, a filter, an abstract filter. And it's, it's, that's really what mindfulness is all about, right? So you actually see what's in front of you, and then you use your imagination. It's not that you reject imagination or rationality, <clears throat> because we're both rational, intuitive beings, you know. We have to use both, but you have to do it, I think, in the right order, so one doesn't get in the way of the other. And uh, so an intuitively guided, rational process is kind of what I kind of described. But Goethe was the, was the best at it, and he explained it so clearly. So, and phenomenology kind of grew out of his thinking. Yes? You talked a lot about, not a lot, but you mentioned spending profits on educating um, you know, clients. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, have you, has your firm you know, spent any energy trying to educate other firms um, about the same process? Um, and, and I guess ha I imagine there's probably some pushback in regards to profit um, by really. being mindful. I, and have you had so, any success in that? A little, a little bit of success. I've given talks about pattern writing and how it's applied to an architectural practice all over the country. <clears throat> and um, if you know EDRA conferences, um, Environmental and Research Design Association, they, we've given a lot of lectures there. The, the problem with the architectural um, community is that it's invested in a style. It's, in, it's heavily invested in style. So a process that, that discounts that investment is looked upon very poor, you know, negatively. So there's been a lot of, there are university, <coughs> I won't name the one that I'm thinking of, the School of Architecture at a major university in the Midwest that won't allow people to talk about pattern language. So that's, that's how crazy it is. I'm just curious um, as to which is your favorite building that you've made? Um, Frank Lloyd Wright said, always said the next one. <laughs> but, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it's hard not to, you know, have that answer too. But. Um, related yes. to her earlier question, um, I have not met you yet, but I'm the resident artist from Milwaukee Water Commons, ah. and Tom's been very involved in helping design a process for us. So we're not building a building; we're kind of building a community around water. And I know that Ann Brummett and Alexa Bradley, our co-directors, have been like really raving about keeping us grounded in this planning process. So it's great to hear you talk about how this process works for you mm -hmm. and how it can, it can be translated to other different projects and Definitely. really has to become your natural way of thinking right. to achieve success in something. Especially, and I think the bigger the project, the more important it is. Right, <clears throat> or the wider the, the diversity of client base. You know, if you have a community that you're dealing with and you want to reach consensus, how do you do that? By proposing designs that people react to? I don't think so. That's never, helped. That's never really worked. But once you ground your process in facts about what's happening, people can either agree or they can argue with it, or, and then finally you come to the point where you actually agree on something and then you move forward. So. Yes. Hi, Tom. Hi. I was curious, when you do design work, uh, what is the, the design of the room that you're in and what sort of music and environment do you put yourself in when you create? Right. Well, we have, typically, right now we have 90 projects going on in the studio. So it's... Only? It's, that you can't really kind of change the whole environment for one project, but we, ha we all work in one big room. It's a, a big power plant in Cedarburg, 25-foot ceilings, glass all the way around. 
and the music is fantastic in that space. <laughs> so it's, it's about building the environment that allows individuals to do, do their best and then for collaboration to occur kind of naturally. What kind of music do you like? I, there's a big range. I, on, I, be I particularly, I particularly <laughs> like Bach. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Good time for one more question. <laughs> do you have a favorite architect or even least favorite? <laughs> well, a favorite architect is, um, there's one that we, there's about five that we really like. And, and one of them is in Texas of all places. And I'm, I'm not, now I'm drawing a blank. Um, oh, now, can you help me with that, Adam? The, uh, the, yeah. Well, anyway, there, there's, a, there's a group called, in Philadelphia called Onion Flats. A uh, very curious group because they build a lot of the things they design. And so the boundaries between construction and design are kind of obliterated, which is something that we've always been in favor of. In fact, we did a lot of construction management in our earlier years when we had smaller projects. So I think Onion Flats would be a good one. Thanks Another so much, Tom. Yep, thank you.